Okay, this webinar is all about forensic stock analysis, analyzing any stock in minutes uh, with fundamental data and especially using the stock reports that we have at Stockopedia. And, and really the goal for this webinar, uh, by the end of this hour, I'd like you to be able to analyze the fundamentals of any stock in minutes. That's quite a bold claim, but I really do think it's uh, very doable. We've designed a lot of our solution to really aid in this. And I think you'll find all the resources I go through will really help you achieve this kind of goal. And it really is so important. I think as investors, we often come to the stock markets really through the narrative of a share. And I remember when I got started, I got really excited by the story of a certain stock. And that's what drew me into making my first purchase. And I think as private investors, we often rely on rules of thumb and heuristics like, you know, like the narrative of a company. And, and often that leads us into quite a lot of trouble. Now, there is this great quote from Benjamin Graham. He says, uh, and Ben Graham was the father of value investing. He wrote some great books. And he said, he also tutored Warren Buffett and taught him most of what he knows. But he said, in the short term, the market is a voting machine, but in the long run, it is a weighing machine. What he means by that is that stories drive stocks in the short term, but it's the statistics which drive stocks in the long run. And this webinar is all about the statistics. And I hope to show you using some of the performance measures and so on that, I, I, that we've compiled, that the statistics really do win out in the long term. Um, so who am I? My name is Ed Page Croft. I'm a chartered financial analyst. I'm the co-founder and CEO here at Stockopedia.com. I began my career in Goldman Sachs private clients. I've run a small fund and eventually I got, uh, you know, a bit annoyed with the resources that were out there for private investors. And that led to the founding of Stockopedia and all the, um, the wonderful community that we've developed here. It's so great to have so many of you on the call and uh, so great to have such a thriving community, even in this what's been a very difficult bear market for the last couple of years. Um, so is this webinar for you? Look, I will say this is a very similar webinar to the one that we uh, did about this time last year. So I don't want to waste anyone's time, but even me going through the slides, I actually remind myself of so many things that I've forgotten. So I think you'll find it's a great refresher, even if you have seen some of the content before. If you are a seasoned investor, th these uh, resources really can save you so much time and effort in your share research process. I, I, I'm, you know, Lucky to know some of the best private investors in the UK. And I'm always astounded at their wisdom and knowledge of uh, financial analysis. And they still use the stock reports for, you know, the quick check and as their first research call on any share before they go much deeper. But if you're an improving investor or someone who's more of a novice, uh, what, what I found, somebody actually said to me once that they used the stock reports and the stock ranks to sanity check stock ideas or stock tips that they got from other places. And this really is a, it provides a really disciplined, proven way to do that. So hopefully all of you will get a lot out of this. Um, and obviously we've got uh, lots of international stock reports. We've got, we cover 35,000 or so stocks all over the world. And I know some people tuning in from Australia and India and other places will get a lot out of this. Um, before I go on, yes, I might be a chartered financial analyst, but I'm not a financial advisor. Nothing we do here is financial advice. We expect everybody here is a self-directed investor. If you shares go down as well as up, and nothing in this is a recommendation. So if you have any, any, you know, concerns, please do talk to a financial advisor. So in this, this will be about an hour and probably an hour and 10 minutes max to get through the content and then we'll do Q&A. So feel free to drop off if you don't want to stay for the Q&A, but I'll try and answer as many questions as I, as I can. Um, firstly, we'll talk a little bit about how you can save time and improve results using fundamental data that like we uh, publish on the stock reports. And then I'm going to whiz through seven key areas to understand for every stock you own, which is a bit of a lightning tour of the stock reports and uh, which I, I think will help you understand the statistics really well. And then I've got a little slide on stock report secrets, some little hidden features that are really worth knowing and very valuable. And then I'm going to analyze three shares very quickly from, a, from different lenses. So a growth share, an income share, and a value share, and some of the different measures I might look at on a stock report when I'm analyzing a share like that and doing my first pass. 
Um, and then we'll go into Q&A and other requests. Now, I, I would say, look, the fundamentals aren't everything. Obviously, if you are doing uh, analysis on a share, you, you really should go and do a lot of other research to really ensure that you understand, you know, the, the qualitative aspects of a company. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that later. So firstly, simple, effective fundamental analysis, how using essential financial statistics can improve your investing very, very quickly. Um, we have these wonderful stock reports on Stockopedia, and there's a little video here, but they're very, very interactive. You can whiz through so much financial data, really get to grips with a stock, and it can be a little bit intimidating if you are uninitiated, but this webinar will initiate you in a lot of these great resources. Um, they actually were born from a bit of a print ethic. You know, I used to use some print products back in the 90s. I'm in my late 40s now, so I've had some time uh, to, to be around markets. But we really brought these digitally, and I love that concise ethic that you can get in a, in a small amount of space. So we try and publish just essential statistics in a really comprehensive, clear design. They're interactive, color-coded, and they allow you to do that forensic analysis in seconds. Why? Because we've really tried to put algorithms on the page rather than just kind of raw data. And I think that's quite important. Um, and what happens if you do use, if you do learn to use kind of data-informed principles in your investing. One thing that we do is we survey our community every year and we've done it every year for quite a long time. And Lawrence and Sam have put this great um, slide together, which just shows that, you know, our subscribers really do sort of tell us that they have much, much more confidence in their investing um, after subscribing to the service and using data informed principles. And I think this, I'm really quite proud of this because, you know, we find this hovers around about the 80 percent mark. And I, and I think a lot of people tell us before they joined us that they kind of used more woolly, unstructured ways of investing. And then they're able to actually, you know, really understand what works in investing and, and apply it. And that goes through into their performance as well. So we generally find that 50% or more of our subscribers in any year tell us that they beat the market that year. And I, you know, I think a lot of the rigor that you get using some of the things I'll talk about really help there. Um, so I won't go into this too much, but this just really backs up some of those points. People saying that they've got, you know, decisions that are much more grounded in data and that, you know, their performance often improves. Lots of reviews on the website and so on. Um, so anyway, I don't want to sort of waffle on there. We're going to talk about seven key areas of kind of fundamental analysis and how you can accelerate that using the stock reports. So some of the things I'm going to look at, I'm going to be using Jet2 which is a pretty well-known brand in the UK now. It's a UK, I think it's one of the biggest stocks on the AIM market. It's a UK provider of leisure travel services. And, and Jet2 has been a huge historic winner for UK subscribers. It started, uh, it was actually called Dark Group way back in about 2013 and was picked up by the FT as qualifying for lots of our, our stock screens and was one of the highest ranked shares back then. It's seven bagged since then, so it's multiplied its share price many, many times. And it was one of the top 10 multi-baggers of the last decade in our, my recent research study. It's been a constituent of my model portfolio that I do publish on the site every year, uh, many, many times. And, and that model portfolio is completely based on some of the data I'll be sharing. And it's beaten all of the fund managers in the UK over the last decade. So there's something to be said for these principles. Um, I'm not a holder of Jet2. I am actually having looked at it a lot in this presentation. I'm actually quite partial to it now. And um, But this is for illustration purposes only. So it's not a recommendation to buy, but it'll obviously do your own research. Um, by the way, in that multi-bagger research report that we put together, we did a load of work on this. There was a report, a webinar, and three masterclasses that we're going to share with you at the end of this webinar. If you haven't seen it, it's a really great resource. I'm turning, turning some of that into actually an article series for our academy. So um, we'll hopefully, um, Lawrence can share the links uh, towards the end of the webinar. And um, so anyway, this is just a screenshot of uh, Jet2 a couple of days ago. And, uh, and we're going to look at some of these key components of uh, the stock report. Firstly, we're going to look at this part, the stock ranks, the quality, value and momentum of the share. 
understanding these really, really three powerful factors that really do drive stock market returns. We're also going to look at this little section here, which is the classification section. And it helps you to really know the category of any stock you're dealing with in a quick phrase. Lots of power. It really packs a huge punch, this section. And I want to get my enthusiasm over for it because I was so excited when we put this together. Um, then we're going to look a little bit at the comparing a stock against its peer group, uh, whether the industry or the market as a whole, uh, across a whole range of financial statistics. And these measures are, are very powerful and they allow you to very, very quickly see the fingerprint of a share's fundamentals against industry and market as a whole. Then we're going to look at some red flags and these can help you really avoid disaster stocks. Uh, these, this little section is based on some time-saving algorithms that were made famous by some finance professors. We read all the financial papers, we built the algorithms, and we put them on the stock reports. So they're very useful. They're not always right, but they're very, very useful. And they're often an indicator to do some extra research uh, if something does flag. Like for Jet2, it's flagging for earnings manipulation risk. I'll talk about that in a short while. I also think it's very, very powerful. We have a bank of about 65 different stock screens that are based on famous financial um, authors. Uh, for example, this one, Joel Greenblatt, who wrote the little book that beats the market. And we actually publish whether a stock is qualifying for any of those screens. So Jet2 is actually qualifying for 10 at the moment, which is actually very high. Um, so you can instantly sort of understand a little bit about that. And we'll explain that in a bit more detail. Now, we've got this extensive financial summary uh, further down the page on the stock reports. And I always like to say that you can use the history of a stock to predict its future. A lot of people don't like looking at backward looking data, but I would say that you can really learn to read the runes of a company if you look into its financial history. So we'll spend some time there. And then finally, the seventh thing is we're going to look at some of the shareholder activity or the sentiment of the smart money. Now, this is very useful because you can look at what the institutions are doing, what the directors are doing, what our community is doing. And also further down the page, uh, look at actually if the brokers are upgrading their numbers. So I'm going to waste no time and I'm going to go straight into the first section. Firstly, quality, value and momentum. These are the three factors that drive stock market returns, or I would say three of the most powerful factors that drive share prices. So in this little section up at the top right of the stock reports, you can see the stock ranks. And in there, you've got the quality, value and momentum rank and the overall stock rank. And it's important to express that these are all ranked between zero and 100 as percentiles. So you've got Jet2 with a stock rank of 98. That means it's in the top 2% of ranked shares in the UK market. Now, something people often say, and someone asks a question, how can the stock rank be higher than all its component ranks? And the reason is that we actually sum those ranks and then we actually, uh, it, it, we re-rank uh, all the stocks in the market based on the sum. So this is actually in the top 2% across the blend of those ranks. And uh, basically what you can think of with the stock rank is that a low ranking share is going to be quite junk quality. It's going to be expensive valuation. It's got quite weak momentum. And if it's high ranked, it's going to be good quality, a cheap valuation and quite strong momentum. And all the academic literature, uh, this has been studied for decades and decades. And generally, they have found that good quality shares beat the market, good value shares beat the market and strong momentum shares beat the market. And that's what we found since we've been tracking the performance of the stock ranks since the beginning of Oh, well, day one for us, uh, which was back in 2013. In 2013, we started publishing the stock ranks and we've been tracking the performance ever since. And this is actually called a decile chart. But this shows that the 90 to 100 rank shares have significantly outperformed the market. And we've built portfolios and rebalanced over time to compile this. And you can find these charts in the learn section uh, under stock ranks and ratings. And you can look at these across different international markets too. But note, notice also that low rank shares have significantly underperformed, and whereas the FTSE all shares in the middle. So we're, this, these results really back up what's, what academic finance has found. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, if there's one thing I'm you know, proud of here is that the stock ranks have been a really good guide to, towards higher performing shares. But it's really important to understand that it doesn't, just because a share's got a 90 plus rank, it doesn't mean it's going to outperform. It's statistically more likely to, but it doesn't mean it's going to definitely. 
And, and this chart really shows this. So there is kind of a hit rate of picking winners in each stock rank bucket. So it, over here, you've got the 90 to 100 ranked shares. And over here, you've got the 0 to 10 ranked shares. And this is actually the win rate over any two-year period on average over the last, um, I think now, uh, 11 years since we've been tracking this. And it shows that in the higher ranked bucket, you're kind of almost two to one likely to pick a winner. But also in that bucket, you might have a third of a chance of picking a loser. So diversification is key. If you just go and buy one or two shares, you know, you're, you're not going to um, necessarily guarantee getting a winner. If you have a good spread, you're going to much more likely sort of generate that higher return bucket or you would have over the past. But if you go and choose just low ranking shares and fill a portfolio with low ranking shares, you, you'd have been very likely to underperform. So there's nothing wrong with picking a low rank share. That's where your fun, your own personal analysis can really make a difference. And, you know, often our small cap analysts do kind of favorably look at certain small, uh, low ranking shares. But if your portfolio as a whole really ought to skew more towards um, higher ranked shares, at least sort of 50, 60 plus to have a better chance, uh, have that kind of tailwind behind your portfolio. So very quickly, I just want to run through the quality, value and momentum ranks. So what we do is we actually have all our computations that go on every night and they kind of bubble up into these rankings. And we have quite a range of different measures that go into these um, algorithms. For the quality rank, we simply look at whether it's a strong and stable business. We look at long term profitability, cash generation capability and the stability of margins and its growth. And they that's one sort of factor that goes into the quality measure. We also look at whether the fundamentals are improving from last year to the next year, to this year. And we use a checklist uh, that goes across a whole range of fundamentals. So a, a company may not have a, a sort of, may not be the highest profitability company in the market, but it might be improving its profitability. And that's quite predictive of future returns. But also we look whether it's safe from kind of more catastrophic risks, for example, bankruptcy risks or earnings manipulation risks. So they all kind of filter together and you get that quality rank. Now, the value rank is a little can be a little bit misunderstood. We take more of an academic view of value, which means that it's a pure measure of blended cheapness. OK, so if the value rank is high, it means it's cheap. If it's low, it's expensive. And we we measure that actually using six financial ratios. We have a few which look at whether it's cheap relative to what it earns. So price to earnings ratio, price to cash flow ratio, price to sales ratio, ratios like that. It builds a composite measure there. We also look at whether it's cheap relative to what it's what it owns, which and we use the price to book ratio to compare the, the share price against um, its book value. And, and that's really very valuable because it means we can create a value rank even for companies that don't have sales or don't have earnings because not all companies have profits. Um, so this blended approach allows us to create a sort of rank, you know, regardless of how a company is, um, uh, you know, whether it's pre-profit, post-profit, it's just got sales, it's currently got losses, we create a really good value rank. And we also use the dividend yield. So we look at whether it's cheap relative to what it pays out in dividends. So this composite measure is, is, is very, very effective, but very high rank value shares um, can be a little bit risky. So it's better to see that they've got good quality. Now, finally, momentum. Now, I think when people join Stockopedia, they're quite skeptical of momentum. But momentum is the most powerful factor of all. It's really surprising. And as a private investor, you really are better placed to benefit from momentum than any institutional investor. And it's worth remembering that. One great positive habit is to buy shares that are going up um, rather than always just bargain hunting. Um, obviously, you can buy shares that have gone up that have just corrected a bit. That's even better. Um, buying the dips is a good strategy. But we actually have two factors that go into the momentum rank. rank. Firstly, we look at whether a share price is strong relative to the market. Uh, if a stock's near its 52 week highs, if it's above its moving averages and trending upwards. But we also look at whether it's got strong earnings momentum. And that means that it, a, it, the company may be uh, analysts may be increasing their earnings forecasts and ratcheting those up. And the company may be beating those forecasts. So they go into both these uh, both price momentum and earnings momentum goes into our momentum rank. And they all come together in that stock rank. So really, that's kind of key. Uh, it's just very, very quickly understanding how this all works. Um, they're very powerful measures. I design most of my own investing philosophies based around them uh, because they're just so effective. 
Um, one other point is that there is this rather wonderful little chart under the share price chart, which is the stock rank history. And that allows you to track the ranking through time. And this is really interesting because uh, during the pandemic and, and post pandemic, Jet2 had a real difficult time. And then suddenly late 2022, the, the, the stock rank rocketed back up into the high 90s. And uh, so there's a bullish zone covered, colored in green and a more bearish zone in red. And uh, and then, you know, the stock started performing well. And actually from that point, it's up about 40 percent since uh, since that rise. I quite like seeing big jumps in stock rank. I kind of think that maybe maybe the market's a bit slow to react. So that's quite good to know. Um, now, a few questions came in in our survey. Thanks for filling in some uh, questions. I can't answer them all uh, about when to sell. Now, when to sell is really a webinar of its own, but just relating to the stock ranks, I often pull up this slide and because I've got this kind of rule of thumb, which is the 90 70 rank rule. Buying when a share is above 90 and selling when the rank drops below 70 is quite effective. And that was a kind of rule of thumb I already had and a few people had. But what I found this paper called Combining Factors by Christoph Reschenhofer that really backed up this thesis. He'd done a huge study on it and he found the optimal point, optimal point was about 93 but selling at about 74. So, you know, anyway, that, that's quite an interesting rule. If you are just using the stock ranks uh, as an investment guide, that's quite a good when to sell rule. I, I can't go into all the when to sell rules in this webinar. Um, this is just a case study of when this worked really, really well for me as one of my big winners in recent years was Reach PLC in the pandemic, a jump above 90. I bought it, it quadrupled, and then the rank fell below 70. You often find that as the valuation increases, the rank falls. And uh, anyway, that then <laughs> the share price dropped dramatically after that. Um, so I was quite glad. It doesn't always work like that. I'm not pretending it does. This is, you know, a rather a cherry picked case study, but it's, um, it's, it's rather illustrative. Let's now look at the classifications. So knowing the category of stock you're dealing with in a quick phrase. And like I said, up at the uh, top here of uh, the stock report under the share price, you see these four phrases. These are different classifications. You've got the sector, the risk rating, the size group, and the style. Now, I like to say that the last three terms are this rather nice little phrase. Jet2 is a speculative, large cap, super stock. Uh, and that's distinct from maybe your kind of highly speculative micro cap sucker stock, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, but these I, I'm going to go through one by one. Firstly, in terms of sectors, I often find that people, when they join Stockopedia or they're just getting started in investing, they often skew their portfolios very dramatically to just a couple of sectors. And these classifications really can help you diversify your portfolio for different styles, risks and also sectors. So let's run through some of these uh, more cyclical sectors include basic materials, which might be mining. They might be chemical stocks and so on. Um, consumer cyclicals are big ticket items. They might be fridges, they might be auto, you know, cars and things like that, that when times are tough, people really ratchet back on. And financials includes investments, banks, those sorts of things, insurers and, um, you know, lenders and so on. Now, those can be quite cyclical industries. Now, in the pandemic, something that happened was you found that many profitable cyclical industries, which can do really well in upswings in the economy, uh, got really hurt. And uh, what you know, but what you found did very well were defensive sectors. So healthcare stocks, pharmaceuticals, and so on. Consumer defensive stocks. You're talking like food, washing up products, things like Unilever, uh, food companies, supermarkets, things like that. And utilities. You know, keeping the lights on. There are lights around me. Uh, those things did really well in the pandemic. Some of those sectors absolutely flew. So having defensive ballast in your portfolio is a really important thing. And, and just recognizing that is key. And um, there are sensitive sectors, too, that are kind of in between cyclicals and defensives. Uh, industrials, uh, you know, Jet2 is in the passenger transportation sector. So it's actually in the industrial sector because it owns a lot of planes. Um, energy stocks, everything from fossil fuels right through to uh, renewables. Telecoms, quite a small sector. And also technology, uh, which, you know, we have so much tech in the world these days. Not a big tech sector in the UK, but obviously big, big in America. Um, so, you know, use those to help diversify your portfolio. I'm going to jump on to the risk ratings. 
And I think these are really, really, really helpful. I was really excited when we put these together. These are based on the share price volatility over the last three years. And they can really help you understand kind of the expected volatility of a share going forwards because it's very correlated with the past. Now, these go from low risk. So if you see a, a share is classed as conservative or balanced, that means they're lower risk. And the highest risk is highly speculative. <clears throat> you often find um, that, uh, you know, m many shares are kind of adventurous. That's kind of in the middle of the zone. Um, but really, you've got a very, very wide uh, share price volatility at highly speculative. And, and risk here is defined as upside as well as downside risk. And so if, you, if your portfolio, often if you're picking small caps, you're going to own a lot of highly speculative shares. But just beware, because in a downturn, they really get hit very, very hard. You'll find that lower risk shares, again, they give you ballast in your portfolio. So a good blend is a wise idea. Um, one thing, I haven't updated this study for a few years, but we found that highly speculative shares as a class tend to underperform in a six year study period that we did, uh, whereas the kind of lower risk shares all did a bit better. So, you know, I think there's some proof in the pudding there. Um, I'm not going to spend much time on the size group, which is pretty obvious if you've been around markets for a while. Large caps, mid caps, small caps and micro caps. Uh, large caps, generally FTSE 100 companies. Mid caps, FTSE 250. Small caps, are, you know, obviously where you can potentially find multi-baggers, uh, but obviously a lot more risky. And micro caps, very liquid. So, you know, I, I think that's enough to say about that. But I often think uh, uh, many people miss, uh, sorry, just to actually say that you can also have the size metrics here, which are next to the stock ranks. So the market cap here is published. And that is how we calculate the size group, obviously. But many people don't know, if you don't know what a market cap it is, I'm sure you do. It's just the, the size of the equity in the business. It's the share price multiplied by the number of shares in issue. Most people think that's the size of a company. But actually, the real size of the enterprise is the enterprise value. And it's really easy to understand, but not many people do. What you do is you add the net debt to the market cap because, uh, you know, a company can borrow as well. And that creates the enterprise value. If this number's higher than the market cap, it means it's got net debt, so there's a lot more borrowings. So it's a quick way of seeing, okay, is a company quite leveraged or not? In this case, the enterprise value is a lot lower, which means this company's got a lot of cash. I would say in the travel sector, they tend to get this time of year a lot of prepayments, so they often have a lot of cash on the balance sheet and it drains down through the year. Um, but I, I use this as a very quick measure to see if a company has got lots of debt or not. Um, and finally, the stock rank style. This is really, really, really powerful. And um, I, I really, it's worth learning and understanding what these classifications are. They are entirely based on the stock ranks, but they show different kind of flavors or styles of companies. Um, there are four winning styles, which are colored in green, super stocks, high flyers, turnarounds, and contrarians. And a third of the market is classified with a winning style. There are a third of the market classified as neutral, okay, which means they don't really have a leaning to any particular style. And there are four losing styles, value traps, momentum traps, falling stars, and sucker stocks. I'm gonna explain this a little bit more clearly. Um, and there's lots of learning resources on this. I know I go at a lightning pace. My father tells me I go far too quickly, and I know I do, but there's lots to cover in this webinar. And, um, Historically, the winning stars generally have outperformed and, and the lo losing stars have generally underperformed because they tend to have lower rankings. But this little schematic will really help you understand how we've put these together. So the winning stars here are above the, the, the line here, and there's four of them, and there's four losing stars below the line. And they're based on the QVM, the quality, value, and momentum ranks. So you can see here that super stocks have generally got high ranks for each of these three rankings, whereas their opposite sucker stocks have very low rankings for each of those rankings. Now, sucker stocks often are jam tomorrow, blue sky kind of companies. They don't have profits, so they've got low quality. They are generally often quite overvalued because they tend to be story stocks and often they've got dwindling share prices because not much is going on. Um, but you know, you can pick a good uh, story stock. It might do well, but the odds are against you. So anyway, winning styles generally have got two or three of those three core factors. Actually, um, they're benefiting from two or three of those factors. So turnarounds are generally lower quality, but they're very cheap and they've got strong momentum. 
often it's a precursor to better quality in future. I love buying turnarounds. I love value and momentum. I think it's a great part of the market to actually find really outstanding winners. But the other place is actually growth stocks, which we call high flyers. So they tend to have high quality and high momentum, but they're often very expensive. So a low value rank, whereas contrarian shares often are good quality and they're cheap, but they've got kind of depressed share prices. So those are the kind of winning styles of share of, of uh, that, that we classify. Whereas the losing styles have only got kind of one factor working for them. Now you see lots of momentum traps amongst popular kind of shares on Twitter or on kind of bulletin boards around and about, and especially amongst the uh, junkier end of the AIM, AIM market, because often share prices pop up on good news and then they often come down again. Um, but those are very kind of expensive, low quality, but high momentum shares. Whereas value traps, often people are very attracted to cheap shares, but they often don't have any profits and they're often in the languishing kind of people are trying to buy a bargain and uh, it can be quite a dangerous zone of the market. But falling stars, I think, are really interesting because you often find really high quality companies in this bucket. But what happens if a, with a high flyer is that it can have lots of profits and it can be quite expensive. But if the momentum stalls and they miss their numbers, they miss their forecasts, they can be brutally corrected. And that turns them into falling stars. And we found falling stars can be very, very big underperformers. So that's a lightning tour of the styles. Do get to them. We will send the slides out. We'll attach them to the replay. I'm going to now go into uh, what I call peer comparison uh, or the traffic lights, which helps you understand the essential statistics of all stocks against their peer group. So we're going to go a bit more nerdy in this section because we're going to be talking about not just abstract numbers like quality, value and momentum. We're going to be actually talking about uh, proper financial statistics. So if we have a look at, for example, the these, this section here, we've got some forecast ratios and some trailing ratios. And we've got the actual number here. And we've got these lovely little traffic lights. Now, these actually compare that number against all the other stocks in its industry group or against the market as a whole. So, for example, in the UK, it would be against the UK market. Um, you can actually change that to compare against global stocks in your settings. But generally, it's going to be local wherever you are. So this company, uh, Jet2, has a 7.9 P ratio, which is quite cheap against the market and kind of moderate against its industry group. If that was a bit more expensive, it would be more average and amber. But if it was very expensive, like a P-E ratio of 45, it would be very red and thin. So it's a quick way to eyeball some of these key statistics and understand how it's looking against the rest of the market. So interestingly, Jet2 has got a fairly low prospective growth rate for its earnings. Um, it may well beat them, but that's the case. And it's got a pretty low dividend yield. It is at least dividend paying, but against dividend payers, it's quite low. So, you know, that's a quick way to read those stats. And, and one thing, I'm going to geek out a little bit here, so bear with me. But you can see that this section here, um, this section here is actually based on forecast data. So they've all got an F, and this is a 12-month forecast rolling data. And uh, just going to nerd out a little bit on what rolling means uh, with the next couple of slides. So just, just bear with me while I explain this, because this is quite important. And I really think this is something you're not going to get in other services, not going to get on free websites. And this really helps you actually compare a company like for like against any other company with different year end reporting dates. So imagine you've got a company, let's say now, and it's reporting in March 2024. The share price is three quid and the earnings forecast is for it to do 20 pence of earnings. That would be a P ratio of 15 times, right? But imagine you've got a different company and it doesn't report for an entire year. It's just reported, but it won't report for another year. Well, according to its forecast, it's on a P ratio of 15 as well. Now, if you looked at both of these companies, you go, well, they're both on a P of 15 and you wouldn't be able to discern between them. You wouldn't know which is cheaper. So what we do is for company one, we take a proportion of this year's earnings and the proportion of next year's earnings forecast. And we create what's called a rolling forecast, which blends proportionally both of these, which would mean it's actually got an earnings forecast of 27 and a P of only 10.9. So, you know, you'd be able to compare that company that's reporting next month much more clearly. You can see, well, it's actually much cheaper than the other company on a P ratio of 15. And in that widget, the top of stock reports, that's what we do. It's really valuable. So, you know, whenever you're comparing companies, understand it's comparing them like for like. 
Um, I would say, obviously, if you are somebody who doesn't want to use forecast data, we've got lots of trailing data. So, for example, the price to book value, price to sales value are all here, and you can use the same traffic lights for those. I'm not going to go into those. Probably need to do a proper fundamental analysis course to actually dig into what all these ratios mean. But the great thing on the stock reports is that all of these things are actually clickable. So you can actually go on and click anything and get a definition on the website. So, you know, dig in there. Lots of learning materials. We put a big prize on education. As you go down the stock report, you will also see some of the profitability or quality ratios. Um, I would say in the multi-baggers uh, masterclasses, there is an entire masterclass dedicated to the financial engines of compounders. If you really want to get to know return on capital and operating margins, please do watch that video. It's only 30 minutes and it's really worth watching. It's a, it, Warren Buffett is all over these kind of ratios. Um, but again, I always eyeball these to see if it's a good company. It should have a good higher return on capital. I like to see that's you know 12% plus because it means the company can borrow and actually earn a kind of excess return. Um, and further down the page, now somebody asked a question about this. This is some other ratios. These are the gearing ratios. They show you how kind of in, uh, how leveraged the business is in terms of the debt it's got. And somebody said they didn't understand the intangibles and the pension. One thing I would say here uh, is gross gearing actually excludes the cash. So it just looks at debt to equity. There's quite a lot of it, the company does actually have quite a lot of debt, but because it's got loads and loads of cash, it means the net gearing is much, much lower. So, the, the, you know, Jet2 does have debt, but, you know, maybe it's got loads of cash because of those customer prepayments. Now, what we do with the what we do with these numbers is we actually do. You can strip out the goodwill or intangible assets that a company might have on its balance sheet. Some people like doing that um, and also add in any pension deficit. So because pension deficits are a bit of a liability, we actually factor those in here. So if you are want, want to be more cautious than these headline numbers, you can use those. I'm not going to go into everything, but, you know, you can go and check all the uh, descriptions. So I'm going to quickly look at the red flags because this is about quick fundamental analysis. Avoid disaster with some time saving algorithms from finance professors. So this little section here gives you the health trend, the bankruptcy risk, and the earnings manipulation risk. I'm going to look at these one by one. Firstly, the fundamental health trend. This is a core component of the quality rank, and this is based on Joseph Piotrowski's F-score. This is a nine-point fundamental checklist devised in 2002, and it measures uh, both the, the profitability and cash flow, but also improvements in profitability over the last 12 months, and also any improvements in, in the company's leverage. Is it getting more liquid? Is it self-funding? And is it, you know, has it got better operating efficiency? So we can see for Jet2, it's scoring nine out of nine. It means the fundamentals really have been improving in the last 12 months. And that's one of the factors that has really pushed up the quality rank. Um, so, you know, you can actually go, uh, I prefer looking for stocks that kind of rank between six, seven, eight, nine, to, to actually see that there is actually that fundamental improvement. Now, this bankruptcy risk indicator is very old and uh, it's based on Edward Altman's Z score. It's from the 70s. And we've kind of standardized these so that you can actually just see them as a bit of a as a meter. Because trying to understand the number, I can never remember what the number really means. Um, but there's a safe zone, a cautious zone and, and a distress zone. Now, I'd say if a company is in the distress zone, it doesn't mean it's going bankrupt. It may mean it's got certain financial issues. It may need to go and raise more equity. It might need to straighten out some debt issues, et cetera. But um, it's worth investigating. Now, the, the last thing I would say is this earnings manipulation risk indicator based on Mesod Banesh's M score, M for manipulation. And that is actually high for Jet2. And this is a mathematical model. And Mesod Banesh really put this study together because he wanted to show that statistics could have identified the Enron fraud. And this M score has identified certain accounting issues at companies like Superdry, um, which actually came out a number of years ago, but it said actually it had accounting issues. Um, and, and so it is actually quite effective. But all of these things are statistical indicators. They're not necessarily right. He found it could correctly identify 75% of manipulators. So there's always going to be um, a, a kind of a, a, hit, a, a sort of miss rate too. So don't just go, oh, that's manipulating earnings. You've got to kind of, there is some nuance there. And if you don't know, ask the community, dig into also the checklist. So if you click that little kind of link, you actually get a pop-up checklist. 
And you can see that there's all the risk factors are actually highlighted out here. Um, and I can sort of show this on the on the site. You know, I can scroll down here. Um, actually, it's, uh, I'm looking at the wrong stock. But if I look at Jet2, I can actually go and see this score. And if it is still showing, there it is. Click it. And you get this checklist. And you can see it says, is sales growth not excessive? That's implying that the sales growth has been really strong. And why is that a risk factor? Well, it's a risk factor because rapidly growing sales companies sometimes have sell pressure on their sales teams to actually kind of give really excessive credit terms to customers. Um, so it often flags here. I think probably for Jet2, it's recovering from the pandemic. So it's, I, I'm not going to say it's not manipulating earnings, but I think it's probably likely that it's just this sales growth that is um, in terms of recovery back to more normal business conditions. Next, we're going to look at very quickly screen rule qualification. So as I said, we've got these 65 books that we've kind of compiled certain strategies from based on quality strategies, value strategies, momentum strategies. Um, this is Joel Greenblatt's little book that beats the market. Actually, I don't have it here, but a great little book. And we compiled his little magic formula. And uh, this company, Jet2, is qualifying for the magic formula. But it's also qualifying for 10 others. So actually, if I go back, I can show you on the stock report. Um, you can actually whiz through and see that it's qualifying for all these different strategies, actually 11 today. So it really is kind of looking quite kind of strong. And uh, so I quite like seeing this. We tag every stock that qualifies for these strategies every day. And personally, I like seeing that it is qualifying for something. It's quite helpful to understand the styles of strategy that it might be qualifying for. And what I can do is I can go and actually click through to go and look at uh, either a checklist based on those rules or actually the screen itself and find other candidate stocks. So that we use these links and you can click through. Now, next, I'm going to look at the financial history. I'm going to just sort of geek out a little bit here on these uh, numbers, because I think this financial summary is kind of so, so valuable. Um, you know, you get all these wonderful little hover charts as you go down it and learning to read this. We have put a lot of effort into designing this well. Um, it's it's quite a, an important thing to get to grips with. So we're going to look at that. Um, so I, there's just a few core areas I want to look at. Firstly, we've got six years of essential statistics at a glance. You can go and dig into 10 years in the balance sheet and income statements if you wish. But on stock reports, it's a bit more concise. You've got the revenue and profit figures up the top. You've got the profitability measures, the cash flow measures, the dividend measures, and certain balance sheet items. We've also got if a company has reported interim or quarterly re results after the last financial end year date, like for Jet2, their last financial year end was March 2023. So they have actually published interim results since. We then actually add in this little trailing 12 month or TTM column, which is more up to date. So our statistics are more up to date than last annual results. And that's really, really important to understand. So quite useful. I, I find that particularly great. And there's also two years of forecast data in here. So the 2024 forecast and the 2025 forecast. And you can see consensus revenue, earnings and dividends from the brokers. So you've got like, you know, seven years there, as well as certain compound annual growth rates over that period of time. So you can see that Jet2 over this little period has actually grown its revenues by 16% annualized and its profits by 22% annualized. It's done just been a, a brilliant business through that period. Now I'm going to zoom in here on the profitability measures. I have gone over this in that uh, video on financial engines of compounders, but so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Higher margin stocks in an industry are preferable for the operating margins. That's the operating profit against the revenues. Um, but actually, given the multi-bagger content that we did, I actually like seeing companies that have got room for those margins to grow. One of the great things here is that you can instantly see that Jet2 had a real nightmare in the pandemic. So this kind of nice progression, if it weren't for those two years, um, when it obviously got thrown into terrible losses, all flights were grounded. And that's what I mean about looking at the history. You can really spot these things. Um, and the return on capital was also kind of heavily, heavily hurt. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to explain these measures greatly in great detail. Um, but, you know, the, the return on capital is a, it really is the percent of profit made on every unit of capital. And good companies can reinvest at that level of uh, 
of return to compound their returns through time. So Warren Buffett will look at these kinds of measures and try and find higher return sorts of companies. So I like seeing that these these measures are, are reasonably high. Do see that financial engines video if you want to dig in more and really, really understand these measures better. And again, again, in that same video, you'll learn more about cash flow. Cash flow is really the lifeblood of any business. The very best investments are cash cows. How do you identify them? Well, I like looking at um, companies where the majority of earnings per share is converted into firstly operating cash flow, which is operating cash flow per share, but then free cash flow per share. OK, you, you what we do here is the way I eyeball this is to look at the operating cash flow, subtract any capital expenditures, and that gives you free cash flow. Because free cash flow can be spent on dividends. It can be reinvested. It can pay down debt, or do lots of great things for shareholders. Um, obviously, Jet2 has quite significant capital expenditures because, you know, it's got to buy planes and that sort of stuff. So um, cash flow is used for those um kind of areas. But, you know, you, you, you've you got to understand that earnings can be manipulated and cash flow is much harder to fudge. So I always like looking at this area and I'll show you a stock later where that's there is a discrepancy. So I like looking at and uh, eyeballing that. Now, if you're a dividend investor, this section is really valuable, um, this little dividend section, because you, you're really... If you're a dividend investor, you should really be checking for a consistent growing dividend without evidence of dividend cuts. Now, again, um, Jet2, crikey, if there's another pandemic, we know the travel stocks are going to get really hurt. So there is risk here. And uh, But you can see the dividend was cut from 7.5, 10p down to zero. And it's been trying to claw it back. And the brokers are now forecasting it's going to get well above what it was. Um, really, uh, there are some companies, and I'll show you one in a minute, that actually don't didn't cut in the pandemic. Uh, and, you know, you something that's a curveball like the pandemic, you just can't really predict. But generally, people look at what's called dividend cover, to which is this number here, which shows how many times the dividend payments are covered by the company's profits or earnings. And uh, it had really good dividend cover until it didn't. Um, but generally, you want to see at least dividend cover of two times. Less than one definitely risks a cut. And uh, also beware other red flags um, when you're looking at dividends. Look for high quality companies. Now, there's a couple of things in this little balance sheet section. I, I could spend literally a whole day talking about all these numbers, but I always like looking at the cash. But I also like looking at this line, which is the average shares in issue. It really is worth being aware, beware of excessive share dilution. And I think especially in speculative stocks and uh, growth stocks or jam tomorrow stocks, you will see a lot of share dilution. And uh, that is really, really expensive for shareholders. Share issuance is kind of the biggest thief of individual investor returns. A lot of jam tomorrow stocks just keep issuing more and more and more shares. And all the promised land that you were promised never, never comes because you've been diluted so much. Um, so look for, ideally, you want to look for kind of stable or decreasing average shares. Um, you, you, you just you know, want to see a company that's ideally self-funding. Um, decreasing average shares. If you if you look up, for example, a company like Next PLC, you'll probably see the share count has decreased. And that means it's buying back shares. That's financial strength. Now, unfortunately, Jet2 had to do rights issues to get through the pandemic. So the number of shares in issue has significantly increased. So, you know, that that is something to be aware of in this stock. So lastly, I'm going to look at smart money sentiment. I know I'm rattling through, but I know everyone will get hungry. So I, when we introduced this to the stock report, so excited. I think it's a really great innovation. And I, I like to eyeball this every time I look at a stock. Right here on the stock reports, you will see uh, the buy and sell sentiment of shareholders. And very quickly, you can see in green, sort of changes in buy ownership, and in red, any kind of selling. And the gray is kind of holds. So this shows that institutions have been accumulating over the recent months. And it shows that directors have actually been selling a little bit in this share and the community has been buying quite a lot. So there's been a big increase in community, Stockopedia community ownership in recent months, uh, whereas actually there's been a little bit of selling. So, you know, it's skewed towards the buys. And you can actually uh, click through on any of these by clicking that view uh, button. So if you click through, you can and if, say if you're interested and go, OK, why are there director sales? Click through and then you'll go through to the director's dealings page and you can see recently there has been uh, there have been a few direct sales. Um, I do know that Philip Meeson is the founder of Jet2 and he has, I think, recently retired. 
Um, I, I think he has actually. And he actually owns 18% of a £3 billion company. So what is that? 500 million or something? So I, I think probably we can forgive him for selling off 40 million worth of, uh, of the equity if he's moving on from his executive role. But um, uh, there you go. It's, it's a, I, I personally like seeing open market buys in stocks. Um, a, a, a stock I bought recently was um, on the beach because it was a two and a half million pound purchase uh, by a uh, non-exec director and uh, right at the bottom. And and I, you know, open market buys are often quite indicative of things to come. Sales, I don't really kind of, they don't concern me as much. Now, further down the stock report in this smart money area is the analyst consensus widget. We have actually scheduled a significant upgrade to this whole section on stock reports, which I'm quite excited about, but I'm still going to talk you through these current numbers. Firstly, there is this analyst recommendation uh, widget, and we publish it because it is kind of published everywhere. And this shows the consensus recommendation of the analysts. Now, the black line, you can just about see the black line there. Uh, that shows the current consensus. And there's a little gray area, slightly hidden here, uh, which shows you the consensus three months ago. What's more important than actually where this lies is actually where it's moving. And because this is moving to the right, that's a good sign because it means that analysts are upgrading their recommendations rather than downgrading them. And that's a core component of momentum. And I would say that the majority of companies are actually rated as buys. But we found in a study we did uh, that buy recommendations from brokers are not necessarily, they don't necessarily have predictive value. We actually found that stocks that have more like sells and hold recommendations often actually do better. Um, but, you know, that's just statistics. What is more valuable is this component here, which is the trend in com consensus forecast for the earnings per share forecast. And just let me uh, explain this. If you look at this dark blue line, this is currently the consensus forecast for Jet2 for 2024. And as you can see, a year ago, or January last year, the brokers were forecasting 2024 earnings per share to be about one pound. But now they're actually forecasting for 2024 about one pound. What is that? One pound 70. So that's been a 70 percent increase in the earnings forecast over the last 12 months. And you know, I like to say trends tend to persist. The trend is your friend until it ends where it bends. And, uh, you know, generally, I like seeing that this chart has got an up and to the right characteristic to it. It means that the brokers are struggling to keep up with the business momentum that the company has. So they really are quite valuable. We found a lot of studies like the one from McKnight and Todd, which showed that European stocks, that the 20% of, of stocks with the highest upward earnings revisions outperformed the lowest by 16% a year. So this is part of the momentum rank and it's a really powerful thing. Always, always scan that. I think it's very valuable. And uh, so there we go. Right. I mean, that is kind of the majority of the core content of this webinar. What I would say is uh, I'm going to go and do some uh, very brief analysis of three stocks. But before I do, I'm going to just show you a few lesser known features on stock reports. So first of all, historic stock reports. What did this stock look like, look like in the past? We often people go, oh, I want to know what the data was in the past. And this is pretty cool. The print button here which does allow you to print a PDF of today's report, but you can track back through time. It's like going sort of, you know, on a way back machine. And I can sort of go all the way back to sort of 20, I don't know, let's go back to the beginning of like 2014. Uh, this was one of our big, big, big multi-baggers. And if I just go back to, let's sort of, I don't know, look, look about uh, beginning of 2014, whatever that is. Okay. And if you click it, you actually get an archive report and you can see here, it was called Dark Group back then, Jet2. And we've still got it, even though the name's changed it is the, in the listing. It had a stock rank of 99. It was qualifying for eight screens. It had pretty good F score. Uh, the, 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 the measures are all looking pretty good. And, you know, the stock is something like seven bagged since that date. And, uh, you know, qu quite impressive. So that's a really, really useful thing to know if you want to go and look at the data going back time. Um, secondly, I have already showed this, but the red flag pop up checklists. So anything on this report is clickable. So if you don't know what price to free cash flow is, click it and you can get a nice little explanation. Um, you get the definition and you get a little explainer, which I think is really valuable. And also you can hover over all of these little rankings and see actually 
you know, look at the P ratio and go, oh, it's ranked 238 out of 842 companies that have got forecasts in the UK. So anyway, the these little measures, uh, the health trend, the bankruptcy risk and the earnings manipulation risk, you can click these and you get these pop up checklists. And I just think these are fabulous. I, 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 I like reading them. I like seeing that everything is moving in the right direction. And as I said, this has got a good F score. It means that the fundamentals are improving. The long term debt is reducing or stable. It's more profitable than last year. It's got more cash than it's making as profit. It's paying down. It's got better ability to pay short debts, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I really like reading those scores. Uh, the stock rank deltas. Uh, this is quite a useful little thing. We do actually publish these little arrows. You see this little uh, little arrow here, a little up carré, and it shows that the momentum rank has increased by 15 points over the last 30 days. So it would have been about an 82 momentum rank about a month ago, and it's really pushed up. Actually, if you hover over all of these, you can see the change. So it's got the same quality rank, but some of these move more than others, and they move especially around different uh, around reporting periods. Uh, when you get new accounts, often there's a big shift in the ranking. So that's quite useful to know, and it's quite easy to eyeball. So I quite like seeing that. And why has the momentum rank gone up? Well, look, the share price has risen, and also the brokers have upgraded their forecasts, and they've upgraded their consensus recommendation. So that's given a little hike to the momentum rank, and it's given a hike to the stock rank. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, a lot of people uh, like investing in AIM shares uh, partly because of the tax benefits. So if you scroll right down here, you can actually look at the exchange and see that this is on the London Stock Exchange AIM market or whether it's on the main market. And if you're trying to shelter inheritance tax or want to avoid stamp duty and things like that, this is uh, useful to know. And you can see if it's eligible for ISAs and SIPs and more. Lots and lots of good information down here, uh, which is rather valuable. Um, one of the things I got on the list, actually, before I go and look at comparison, is the director profiles. Um, these in this section on directors, you can actually go and see that we've got the CEO here and you can click it and it opens in a new tab with the guy's name and the company name. And you can quickly go and look at the director page or go and have a look at them on LinkedIn. And uh, on LinkedIn, you can go and look at what their experience is how long they've been in the company, et cetera, et cetera. So it's quite valuable as a, as a research tool to be able to do that. I like the fact that that's pre preloaded. And the last thing I wanted to show you was um, the comparison tools. So further down the stock report, of course, yes, we've got the latest news, upcoming events, um, and also the similar stock section. So this is quite useful because you can click and go, okay, I want to compare EasyJet against, sorry, Jet2 against EasyJet, Wizz Air, and maybe IAG, um, I think they own British Airways. So let's let's compare, click the compare button and you will whiz through to this rather wonderful page, um, which is called the compare page. And there's Jet2 and you can instantly see it's winning on 17 out of 40 characteristics against all these other three companies. And vertically, you've got all those classic stock report uh, metrics size metrics, the stock ranks, the forecast metrics, the valuation ratios, the quality ratios, the momentum ratios and more. Um, but it looks at the actual individual ratios and you can see it's winning. And, and that's really, really useful. The other way of getting there, if you are on the stock report, is to use tools and you can click compare and then you can just search for any, any share. So for example, I can look at on the beach and EasyJet um, quite easily to compare that stock and you can see it's winning. Uh, leaves me wondering why I own on the beach. Anyway, there we go. So it's it's been um, almost an hour. And what I'd like to do now is just before we go on to Q&A, I would like to just have a quick look at three stocks from different lenses and how I might quickly scan the stock reports for those shares. First up, a growth share, then a value share, and then an income share, because these stock reports are very versatile. So if you haven't heard the phrase GARP, you will hear Paul Scott and Graham Neary talking about GARP shares. GARP stands for growth at a reasonable price. It's a perennial strategy. It's a fantastic way of investing. Finding growing companies, small caps often that are reasonably priced is a, is a really good way of making money in the stock market. Jim Slater got me into investing. I read all his books, The Zulu Principle, also One Up on Wall Street by Peter Lynch. Lots of luminaries have really advocated for this strategy. And, uh, you know, a very quick kind of financial ratio checklist might be to check that the P ratio is under 20, 
that ideally the earnings growth rate is 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 higher in the percentage term than the P.E. ratio. So, for example, if it's got a P.E. of 20, you might want to look for a company that's got an earnings growth rate of more than 25 percent. Um, and a quick shortcut for that is called the PEG ratio, a uh, PEG of less than one. Uh, I'll, I'll show that in a minute. You also want to see that they've got good profitability, so a reasonable return on capital employed. Not too much debt. Our multi-bagger uh, research showed that all our multi-baggers had, uh, I think, uh, a gearing ratio of less than 50% in terms of net gearing. And so not too much debt is kind of important. And beating the market, you really want to see GARP shares that are kind of at least got some relative strength in terms of the share price against the market. So, you know, this sort of lens. Now, let me just show you how I might look at a stock. And <clears throat> I will disclose I do own this stock. It's called Journeyo. And Journeyo has become quite popular with private investors. Um, but I've owned it for quite some time now. And I know Slater Investments own the share. And, and quite a few uh, uh, stock pickers I, I, I respect. But it has had a really good run. It's had a very good run. So, you know, one has to be aware of that. But if I was to look at this for some of those measures I just spoke about, uh, the P ratio under 20. OK, it's got a P ratio of forecast basis of 11.6. If you want to know that the, the historic P ratio, just look down here. And actually on last year's earnings, it was on 27 times earnings. So a much higher. Um, but it's actually falling. That that P ratio is falling as the company grows. So on a forecast basis, it's got a P ratio of about 12. And the forecast earnings per share is about growth is about 16%. So the PEG ratio, which is one divided by the other, is about 0.8. So that's pretty good. I like seeing a PEG ratio less than one. And I always like in these shares seeing that it qualifies for the Zulu Principles screen, which is one of the first books I read in stock picking. So that's all good. Community buying a lot. Um, I would say there probably is some crowding in this share, which is probably why it's a bit volatile. Good return on capital. Good to see that that's pretty, pretty positive. But one thing I would add here. Oh, look, earnings manipulation risk. Uh-uh. Why is that? I click the checklist and I quickly see, are accruals low as a proportion of assets? No, they're not. What that means is this is not generating cash from its profits. OK, so let's have a quick look. As I showed you, earnings per share, you know, you've got kind of doing about 10p and then 16p in the trailing 12 month section. And then if I compare that with the operating cash flow, it's less than the earnings. And that is a red flag, I have to admit. And um, this is, uh, you know, got a patchier cash flow record and free cash flow is actually really rather patchy. And that is something to, you know, dig into as a shareholder. The capex is quite high. Um, th this company does do um, you know, a lot of sort of installations of screens and that kind of thing in railway stations and so on. So there is a bit of CapEx going on. Um, and I know it has been acquisitive. So, you know, that's something it, it, it does actually have a lot of cash at the moment. It's got 11 million in cash. But as you can see, it has again, it's, uh, you know, it's it's increased it's, it's, it's the number of shares in issue. So it's done a few placings. And uh, but, you know, the good thing is the EPS has been increasing. But I would say that is a bit of a red flag. There's, it doesn't have much uh, debt. It's got pretty low net debt, as you can see. It's got net cash, actually. Um, and again, you can spot that from these numbers at the top, a 45 million market cap. But the enterprise value much lower. It's got net cash. So anyway, that's a growth stock. That's something I would always uh, the way I'd quickly scan a growth stock. And I, I might even uh, click through and try and find some others. Um, anyways, quite good to know. I'm going to go and have a quick look at a value stock now, um, a value stock checklist, value and momentum. This is a, a turnaround strategy. I'm a big advocate of value and momentum. They are the two most powerful factors in the stock market. Turnarounds are great types of shares. I really fundamentally believe this. And um, good style advocates, uh, Peter Lynch, James O'Shaughnessy, Charles Kirkpatrick, a quick ratio checklist would be something like this. Uh, a low price to sales ratio. James O'Shaughnessy, his tiny Titan screen looks for price to sales of less than one. Uh, you really are looking, you want to look for really cheap stocks. So price to earnings ratios less than 10, um, perhaps. And you want to see them having strong relative share price strength. So really moving up, significantly beating the market. So cheap stocks on the move. That's what you're looking for. Um, and ideally, you'd want to see recent upgrades by the brokers. Again, not too much debt profitability improving. And ideally, you want to see them as a small cap. Um, I'm going to look at a share. I don't own the share, but actually my kids 
actually do own this share. Uh, it's called Mears, and uh, we're going to have a very quick look at Mears Group. So let's have a look at Mears. Now, I, I bought this for, for the kids about a year ago. Um, and, and again, I can track back through time and, and go and look, show you what the stock report looked like in around January 2023. And the reason I bought it was I didn't literally I didn't know much about the company at all. But it had very, very it was very high value and momentum. You can see there the value was extremely good and the momentum was actually just improving. Actually, the brokers, I think, were upping, upping their numbers, significant upgrades and a huge shift to strong buy. So it went from being a buy to a very strong buy across the four brokers. So something was going there. The share price hadn't responded yet. And that was one of the reasons uh, to, to buy it. Um, now, it's, it, the, the, the quality has really increased. So you see how turnarounds can turn into super stocks. So it was a turnaround, it became a super stock. The quality has really increased. The value has dropped a bit because it's obviously gone up a lot. It's gone from about £2 up to about £3.50. And this is kind of the dynamics of the stock market. Really, really interesting. So again, the price to sales ratio is very low. The P ratio is under 10 on a forecast basis, although a bit more premium on a historic basis. And uh, it's, it's profitable. It's qualifying for some screens. Um, and, uh, you know, it is it is generally uh, just still a small cap. It's just edging up to becoming a mid cap. And uh, and the gearing is not too high, about 50 percent. So, you know, that is a kind of a very quick kind of scan of a value and momentum stock. I did ask Ollie because I saw this. The directors uh, had really reduced their uh, their holdings. And actually what I found is that there are no director sales in, in the, the recent uh, months. Actually, they've been buying. But actually what that signifies on the stock report, one of the directors actually has left the board. So because his ownership, he's no longer on the board, it actually shows that the director holdings of the company is reduced, even though he still holds the shares. Anyway, just a curiosity. And finally, I'm going to show you a, an income stock. If you're a dividend seeker, some of the things to look at if you're a dividend seeker. So quality income, uh, good quality income stocks. Um, I do recommend going and checking out Jamie, who's a subscriber at compoundincome.org. He's got a great website all about quality income. I'm going to give you a quick financial ratio checklist. Um, I would be looking for a yield of at least 5% in this higher rate environment. You want to see that yield growing. You want the price to earnings ratio not to be too high. Uh, no point buying really expensive yield stocks, in my opinion. You want to look for a dividend cover of at least two and ideally no dividend cuts in the last 10 years. Um, it really is quite important. And a return on capital that's good with a very high quality rank. I like seeing in dividend shares quality rank at least 80, ideally more than 90. And, um, and also low volatility. Look at the risk rating. You want to kind of look, see if it's got more balanced or conservative risk rating. And mid and large cap is better for an income portfolio. So probably not small caps unless you're building up a, a dividend growth portfolio. So let's have a little look at one. Here's one I prepared earlier, IG Group. So IG, I use it, spread betting company um, and a terrific business, been around forever. And they are really the market leader in spread betting. And as you can see, a 2 billion market cap, no real debt to talk of. They've got cash on hand. I can quickly eyeball that. I can see the risk rating is balanced. That means it's pretty low risk. It doesn't, it's really not a hugely volatile stock. And it's a large cap. No great sort of style footprint. It's got a good stock rank, but it's, you know, it's very high quality, but it's got no kind of strong other characteristic. Um, the P ratio is very low, 7.4 on a forecast basis. Got some earnings per share growth. And the dividend yield you can see is 7%. That's pretty good, pretty high. And, uh, you know, so qualifying for a defensive investor sort of uh, screen and good returns on capital. So if we go and scan down, we can see the revenues have been pretty stable and steady, good profitable business, operating margins are very high, although they have been declining recently. And the return on capital, again, that's declined a bit, but still very high, well above the cost of capital, 16%. Um, but I guess maybe that's a concern. Why is, is, is there more competition in that sector? Um, but we can see it generates lots of free cash flow from its earnings, uh, not, not, you know, doesn't match the earnings, but in some years, it's done way better in terms of cash flow, like in the pandemic. Uh, it really spat off cash in the pandemic. But the dividend per share, you can see it wasn't cut in the pandemic at all. So 2020, 2021, there was no dividend cut because everyone was still trading. People were online and uh, IG just kept operating as normal. 
and um and you can see the dividend cover is not enormous back two times mm, i would get worried if that got much lower but uh you know it's got a very very good dividend track record lots of cash and uh, as you can see it's been buying back shares um, it did seem to issue some shares in 2022, maybe for an acquisition or something. Um, but that's kind of how I would look at it. Um, one one risk factor is that brokers have cut the estimates. But again, this is an income stock. So, you know, you're looking at kind of other factors. So that's what I would look at. Um, really, that's kind of all I've got for, for now. I'm now going to go into Q&A. Um, so I'm going to look at anything. I haven't got time to look through all of uh, the questions. I will do my best to answer some. You know, feel free to drop off if you don't want to stick around for Q&A. But there were a few kind of pre-submitted questions I'm going to have a look at. Um, somebody asked a very good question about McDonald's. Um, and I think the question was, uh, why is McDonald's book value negative? I'm sure I'm being naive, but negative book value would make me think the comp company was insolvent. Very good point. So, like, scroll down here and you can see that McDonald's has got a negative book value. Which, um, which means that it's got negative equity. And normally you, you associate negative equity with, um, with, with companies that have been really, really lost, create, uh, which, which have accrued a lot of losses. And actually the way I'll answer this, because uh, this actually came up when I was looking at the multi-baggers. If you go on the balance sheet, you can actually see that it's actually got lots and lots and lots of treasury stock. Treasury stock is something uh, when a company buys back shares, you can account for it in a couple of, couple of ways, um, but you can use like retained earnings to buy back shares. So because this company spits off lots and lots of profits, it's bought back more and more and more shares. And uh, so and, and, you know, so it's still got lots of retained earnings, but it's bought back a lot of shares into Treasury stock, which actually ends up showing as negative equity. I, I, th I think so. I haven't pre prepared this, but there's another way to account for it. Um, which doesn't create the same thing. And I think Microsoft does the same thing, but doesn't actually show treasury stock because I think it um, it accounts for it in a different way. So it doesn't end up showing negative equity. But I, I hope that kind of illustrates the point um, that it's not necessarily a big red flag. Um, when reading the stock ranks, is it better to go for a middle to high 80s with room to move up or 95 plus? Well, I mean, you know, it... it I, I I would say look, I've got a big publication I'm going to be doing in the next couple of months on the stock ranks. Um, you actually can look at the performance of what we call Vigintiles, uh, which is buckets of uh, ranks of five. Um, we, we've generally seen in the UK that, um, sorry, this might take a, a moment to compute, but generally we've seen that higher rank shares have outperformed, but on average, I, I, I personally think it's splitting hairs um you know focusing on specific rank levels i like seeing that ranks have recently increased rather than uh you know because it means that the data is quite fresh but uh, generally a basket of shares um so you can see here look as an example if i just you know if i just uh focus uh get rid of a few of these well you can see that um hang on let me just do this sorry i'm being a bit slow um but i can actually remove some of these and you can then look at the 80 plus kind of sets on their own in a little bit more clarity, hopefully. Um, yeah, there you go. So, you know, 95 to 100 is actually underperformed, 90 to 95, 80 to 85 is up there and 85 to 90 is down below. I mean, you know, isn't that funny? The 80 to 85 has done better than the 85, 90. I just don't think you should read into this. Uh, you know, generally the kind of the theme is that the basket of shares that are high ranked have had a tendency in the past to outperform. No guarantees um, in, in, in the future, of course. Um, anyway, there you go. And um, there's a question here about NVIDIA. I mean, look, uh, NVIDIA, someone's saying, why why do we not pick up stocks like NVIDIA? And, um, you know, I, I think, look, NVIDIA is, is ranked as a high flyer. It's a you know great growth stock. It's extremely expensive, amazing business, huge quality, spitting off. Uh, you know, it's got fantastic return on capital. Um, I mean, the free cash flow has actually been uh, pretty high actually from eyeballing it here um and you know presumably they're they're investing a lot and they're even paying dividends now uh you know i imagine the competition is going to come in with this but the earnings per share growth is absolutely super super high um and obviously we, we've had this ranked i mean we used to have this ranked as a 99 ranked share way way before it made the move you know back in 2014 when it was on five dollars you know, it, it's hundred bags since then. And this is one of the highest ranked stocks in America. Um, there was a moment in when it corrected uh, in the 
uh, correction last year where it actually dipped to a very low rank. Uh, so, you know, arguably you could say, well, you know, we didn't catch it right at the bottom there. But actually when the rank jumped sort of after that, um, it started ranking really nicely and looked like a high flyer again. So, you know, you can't catch them all. These are probabilistic. But actually, it's done pretty well, the ranking system in, in high quality momentum shares in America. Um, right. I'm going to try and do some live questions. Um, uh, I have a question already. I'm in the UK. Um, uh, I've, I, sorry. Uh, yeah, somebody's talking about basically um, banking charges for payments of dividends. Um, so I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure... I mean, I know there are there is a W8 Ben form, which uh, there is a kind of a, a taxation treaty between the UK and the US, which I think does help on these things. Um, and let me just see. Do the stock ranks work well in the USA? I mean, it's a good question. I mean, um, I, I, you know, they have not worked as well in the USA as they have everywhere else. And, and I think the USA is a is a you know, really unusual scenario. I mean, if you look at the ranks in lots of different markets, like in India, they've been amazing. Um, I think in, in Europe, they've been, you know, done really fantastically well. You've got the spread between the green and the red cohorts. And in the USA, uh, they haven't done nearly as well. And they've actually, um, you can see that 90 plus ranked shares have actually done, well, if I exclude the S&P 500, you can see the spread. You see 90, 80, 90 and 90, 100 shares have done way better than low ranked shares. So they've still kind of worked, but they haven't beaten the S&P 500. Okay? And the S&P 500 is really unusual. There's a huge index bubble in America, the Magnificent Seven. You know, it's, it, no one's been able to beat the S&P 500. Um, now, I personally think there is a real problem in America with the index bubble. There, I, I'm not going to go into it in this webinar. But um, I would say, yes, the ranks have worked in America, but just not nearly as well um, as the S&P 500. Um, so either you bought the index, anyone who hasn't bought the index has underperformed. The median share in America has probably only done 40% over 10 years versus the S&P 500 doing 150%, whereas high rank shares have done about 110, 120%. So there you go. Um, but the ranks have done pretty well throughout the world. Um, yes, Philip, you can. I mean, I have on very regular occasions used low ranking shares as candidates to short. Um, it, it, it is something that I've done using IG. And one year I did really well out of this. Um, I bought high ranking shares and sold low ranking shares. The problem is you can't, uh, they don't let you short very many shares in, in, in um, IG, which is quite frustrating. But yeah, the idea being, you know, for anyone who doesn't understand what we're talking about, um, is that there is a spread between high ranking shares and low ranking shares. And if you could earn that spread, you could do even better. Um, but actually, there are difficult moments. So let me just show you this period, which was the pandemic period, where low ranking shares outperformed high ranking shares. So sometimes high rank, low ranking shares can outperform in unusual ranking, uh, unusual market environments. So um, I think that was that was really startling to me is, is, is that that period of the bounce when everyone was being given checks and everyone was speculating the low ranking shares massively outperformed. But then, you know, they kind of reverted to the norm um, over time. So uh, really, really interesting. You have this kind of massive rocket and then they declined again. Um, let me just have another look. Um, OK, the growth rank. Uh, somebody's asking about the growth rank. Yeah, we don't put it on the on the stock report, but you can add it to tables. Um, let me just show you on a little kind of uh, watch list. Um, I've got a little research list of shares I'm looking at. And uh, hopefully this will load. Um, what you can do is edit these tables. And we do actually have a, a growth rank. So if you click customize on a table, if I, if I search for growth rank um, and you add it into the table, and I can just drag this around here. Uh, I'll drag it next to the QVM ranks. We've got a little growth rank here. Not many people knew that. And uh, it's it's compiled in a very similar way, but it just focuses on growth, historic growth. What we actually found is that the growth rank didn't perform uh, as well. And uh, we found it was very cor correlated with the quality rank and the momentum rank. So we actually dropped it um, out of our first iteration of the stock rank. But it is there and you can use it if you if you like. Um, so there you go. Um, Da, 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 da. Um, oh, someone's asking about the back testing of the ranks. I, I'd rather probably talk about stock reports, but yes, those performance histories. If a stock was ranked ninety now, it uh, but it was ranked 
70 last year, it's, it would have been included in the 70 ranked bucket. So that's how it works. We actually compile buckets on each date um, and, and track forwards in terms of that. Um, so, I mean, there's a few questions about data. Actually, I've got a couple of slides on, on data. I want to help people understand our data because um, our data comes from, uh, really, it comes from a few key data sources. We, we, we have lots of stock exchanges, London Stock Exchange, uh, New York Stock Exchange and more. Uh, Refinitiv is actually been bought, what, what, Refinitiv span out of Thomson Reuters, okay? And then it's recently been acquired by London Stock Exchange. And um, so we actually get the majority of our data from London Stock Exchange. But we've also got some niche providers like Smart Insider who give us our director's dealings data. And that all comes in on a daily basis. Every single night we get that data. And generally for after results for large caps, the data comes in very, very quickly, normally the next day. But for small caps, there can be a lag. And um, so that is worth being aware of. We're working on some ways with Refinitiv to speed that up. Um, we actually do get partial data very quickly. But to compile our stock reports, we actually need more complete data. So sometimes we can't publish that partial data that's kind of scanned in. We need it to kind of be a bit more audited. Um, so anyway, throughout the day and night, we import all these, this data into our Amazon cloud. And then we crunch it. We've got all our scripts, which kind of, you know, generate this. And we rank and screen the market. And we publish it before the open every day. So, you know, when you're on a stock report, um, you know, if we go back to Jet2, uh, that will be updated. I don't know what time it is now. I think it's like 5 a.m. or something every day, certainly well before the, the market opens. So all the fundamentals are updated daily. And um, they're updated in a kind of really timely way. You can actually go and, um, you know, if you go and look at about our data, you can go and click in and, and read a lot more about our data process, data quality, data timeliness, and all of that. So that will answer your question. Go and dig in there. Um, Bruce Fleet, um, uh, the value rank, high, how, how high is too high? I mean, that's a really good question. Like if I go in here and I look at some stock rank styles and let me go and look at value traps. Um, so we've got a, a few stocks here that are value traps. And I can go and very, very quickly go and look at a few of these. And, I, you know, I don't know what's going to happen to these stocks at all. Um, in fact, I know some some uh, investors I really respect are buying a lot of H&T at the moment. So, you know, but anyway, um, let's just have a look. I, I don't know any of these particularly well. I mean, I do know H&T, actually. They're, they're the pawnbroker. Used to own them in the past. Um, now, this has got a value rank of 81. And it's marked as a style of a value trap. And uh, but I know it's very, very it is, you know, really, really quite cheap. Um, 81 is not too high. I, I would say if you're looking at it, if I was to screen for a stock and I, I, let me go and look at stocks that have got a value rank of uh, of, let's say, 99 or 98. Um, it, it, that is, to me, um, can be a bit of a red flag. Um, so, you know, for example, like, OK, here's Reach PLC. <laughs> um, let me have a little look at reach PLC. And as I said, I four bagged this in the pandemic and it's so cheap. This kind of stock, it, it, it keeps sort of having these great runs, great runs. And, you know, maybe it'll have a great run again. I don't know. Um, but, you know, I, I did very well, timed it very well then. And um, but, you know, it, it, it's really loath, partly for its pension deficit and also because they own a lot of newspapers and there's a di digital turnaround here. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's it's extremely, extremely cheap. Uh, how how cheap is too cheap? Uh, I don't know. But I, I would say that anything that's got a value rank of 90, you know, 95 plus, um, it's worth always ensuring that's coupled with a high rank of one of the others. That's what I generally tend to do. Um, yes, uh, we, we will. We'll do the Q&A's definitely. Um, I'm going to have a look through some more of these, see if I've got any more questions. Um, oh, this is a good question that came through. When you're analyzing the cash, how how to know how long the cash will last? Um, that's a very good question. I mean, look, here you've got, um, you know, here you've got, got reach. And it's got, what, 11 million in cash on the balance sheet. Um, but I know, I think it's, uh, I mean, actually, I, I would probably rather look at a company like Avacta um, you know, because these kind of companies often are okay. Th this is a sort of classic of actor. Uh, actually, I'll start with Peloton because in this webinar last year, I used Peloton as an example. And a year ago, 
this was a uh, sucker stock and it was a low rank sucker stock. And I brought it up and I did a whole demonstration on it. And, uh, and it has lost 70% since then. And uh, so, you know, again, you can go and look back a year ago at Peloton and it will say it was a sucker stock. It had a, a very, very low ranking. And, um, but, you know, and what's happened um, since then, I don't know whether they've issued some more shares. It does look like they have issued some more shares. Um, they don't seem to have lost too much cash, um, but they're down from 1.2 billion to 738. And what you want to do is try and look at the cash consumption of the uh, of the operation and try and project how long until the next um, until the next uh, fundraising. But Avacto would be another one. You know, this is a you know very jam tomorrow stock. Um, I think my brother sold it now. And uh, many people think this is the greatest thing since sliced bread and they're going to revolutionize cancer treatments and so on. And many people own it. And um, I'd be delighted if this stock fulfills its promise. It really does have some great technology. Um, but again, you know, very low ranked. And why? Because it's got not making any profits. It's not really got much in revenue. Revenue is projected to increase, but the net profit is so negative. So, you know, when you're losing 40 million a year on 10 million of sales, you've got to find 30 million of cash. Um, every time, every year. And um, so, you know, it keeps having to raise money. So, that, you know, as you can see, it's it's having to do fundraisings. And that cash balance, it keeps dropping and then they do a fundraising and it gets more cash and it drops. So, you know, if it's losing, you know, 40 million and only making, uh, you, know, you, you know, you know they're going to have to do a fundraising in some regard um, or finance it in some way. And that's why you've got that bankruptcy risk. Uh, it doesn't mean it's going bankrupt. It means it's got to do something about the numbers. Uh, so, you know, always good to know. Um, good question from uh, David Powell. A good question on dividends as well. What factors determine a change in the stock rank? Uh, great question. Um, and I, I wish we could think of a, a company that's recently reported annual results. Um, just trying to think of one. Anyway, um, when you have a company's annual results report, uh, you will find that there will often be a big jump in the quality rank because the quality rank of all the ranks is most dependent on new results. Uh, so, you know, generally like so if we go and jump back to Jet2 as an example. You can see over the last two years in, well, November 2022, there was a massive leap in the stock rank. That to me sings of a fundamental statement. Now you can see that the fiscal year end is in March and it's probably got interims in September and likely reports them in around November. Okay. So the, the, the half year end, sorry, uh, March plus six months. Is, is that September? Probably is. And, and that means that the, 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 the half year is over in September, but they'll probably announce the interim results in, in, in October, November. And then when that data comes through, you saw the massive jump in the stock rank. And the, the quality numbers would have would have absolutely rocketed up and and potentially the value, the value rank would have changed, too. So that new set of financial statements is probably always the biggest impact on the stock rank uh, when they are significantly different from the past. The value rank, let's say a share that's, um, you know, if, if you think of a share that's gone up uh, considerably in price and um, uh, what were some some of the. Uh, biggest winners uh, last year was, I think Plexus was one of the biggest winners. Um, I, I'm trying to think of of, of companies that, re I mean, U Group is, a, is one that uh, actually did terrifically well in, in last year. And uh, so it went from 175 up to kind of, you know, um, you know, when when a multi bag through the year. And the value rank actually went from, I presume, from something much lower uh, sorry, much, something much higher to, to 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 a much lower ranking as it got more and more expensive, and um, so generally the value rank will be impacted by the valuation. Uh, whereas the momentum rank, you will as the share price rises, you will see that the momentum rank increase, and as the brokers upgrade their forecast, the momentum rank increases. So interestingly, this still has a very high momentum rank, and uh, so and and value and momentum often counteract each other. If if the valuation gets really expensive. And the, you might see the value rank drop and the momentum rank rise, which actually sort of counterweight each other. So there we go. Um, let me just see. Uh, 
let me have a look at some of these questions. Have we considered adding ESG? Yes, we have. Um, I don't, I wouldn't say we've got any plans to add it. It's actually quite hard to find really good providers of ESG data. And, uh, you know, generally there is a lot of greenwashing that goes on in, in stocks. I mean, I, I've looked at ESG data. I'm not discounting it. I think there, there's a lot we can do, but I have seen, for example, uh, you know, companies like, um, you know, oil companies with really, really high ESG scores and so on, which, you know, I don't have anything against oil. I think we all need oil, but it's quite interesting, isn't it? That they can kind of get good environmental scores and things like that. Um, but anyway, I would really like to add it. I just think it's really important for the next generation of investors too. And I think there's a lot we could do there. Um, uh, no, uh, Christoph, no, we haven't thought about doing an API yet. Uh, really, it's about demand and, and we haven't had enough demand. Um, the data is downloadable uh, through, you know, uh, just really through CSVs, but we haven't done an API. It's not really our market, developer market. Um, net debt. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Net debt, if it's positive, is that good or negative good? Um, well, I, I, I prefer seeing net debt negative because it means a company's got net cash. Um, if it's Obviously, you want a company to maximize its returns for investors. And uh, so having some debt, if you've got a good business, borrowing is a, it accelerates returns for shareholders. What you don't want is it to be too risky. You know, if you've got net gearing of more than 100 percent, you're going to have a lot more risk. Um, uh, it's a good question. Will we be adding a multi bag of screener? I mean, look, I, I've you know, please do go and check out. Um, I hope that uh, let me just see. There is this link. I, I, I We probably got. Uh, this page is is the one, and and I'm very proud of the content that, that we put together here. And I, I would suggest you use that link. And the one the one module I would recommend for just understanding financials is the un financial engine of compounders. This one it's about a half hour uh, half hour video packed with fantastic slides. We will be adding it to the academy. Um, all the modules are great. I put tons of work into this, huge amounts of work. And the screening one is terrific too. And I've got some pre-rolled screens and you can build them yourselves. I've got my two by two framework here um, that I use and it's only got 26 stocks in it. And some of the stocks that show up are like McBride, U Group, Good Energy, Kitwave, um, uh, Team Internet, some of these stocks I own uh, on the beach uh, and, and, you know, lots of interesting companies. And of course, if you expand that to Europe or the USA, you find so many more. And, and I have to say in Europe, there are some amazing businesses, Sweden, Norway, the rest, you know, really think about adding uh, regions to your subscription, because I, honestly, I found some extraordinary businesses in Europe. And, and you know, uh, as the UK market's got a bit kind of like narrower, uh, you know, sometimes actually broadening your universe is really, really interesting. Um, there's, there's lots of fantastic businesses out in, um, in, in Europe that are, that are kind of really little, little understood. And uh, it's really great. Stockbeat is such a good jumping off point for these kinds of um, markets. Um, da, 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 da. Um, our list of major shareholders not as comprehensive as other sources such as FT.com. I mean, I'd say, look, we, we publish the top 10 uh, shareholders. Our, our data comes from Refinitiv. It comes from Capita. We, we've got a line into the uh, actual registrar uh, from Capita. So it's pretty much as up to date as, as you're going to find. Um, but it, it's probably, I would say other, other companies might use fact sets who've got quite good major shareholder data too. Um, but they really are the two kind of best in the market. Um, good question, Phil. Some stocks don't have, uh, Z scores. So IG group, in fact, all banks and financials, we do not publish a Z score for. So that's something I'd love to actually swap it out for something else, but generally it's because they don't have, uh, the day we, it's irrelevant. The, the bankruptcy risk indicator is irrelevant for banks like Barclays and uh, and financials. So we actually exclude it. And that's actually uh, in line with the original research. So I'd like to swap it out for a kind of a more uh, bank specific set of indicators. But um, anyway, uh, yes, investment trust. We do want to add more data there. Um, and uh, anyway, I, I think probably covered most of these. Um, I think I've tried to answer quite a range of questions and uh, I think there's probably enough. I'm very conscious that Lawrence needs to go and get his supper and I do probably too. I really hope it's been a valuable webinar for you and for you all. And um, I know we've mostly focused on the fundamentals and, you know, do do, do all your own research, of course. And uh, and of course, you know, if you are, if you have any questions, 
you feel free to ask us in support and also feel free to ask the community if you go into the discussion area um you know we've got such a thriving community so many comments every day and please do just ask other investors like go uh, you know the, the, and or even just put up a whole post here asking a asking a question to the community you'll find that other people will answer them it doesn't have to be our support team but the support team are here and we can help um and yeah there's this great new academy that we're kind of filling with great content um so the, the link isn't there yet it's going to be in the learn tab but there's this stockopedia academy and we've got great materials on multi-baggers it's not all in there yet we're gradually migrating more and more content in there so um you know please do go and check it out and uh, tell us what you think um thanks a lot really appreciate so many of you joining the call today and uh, all the best thanks for listening and uh wish you safe investing uh have a good evening